Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to the No Fly Zone, uh, brought to you by the Center for Law and the Environment at the Allard School of Law at the University of British Columbia. Good morning, welcome. My name is Stephen Wood. I'm the director of the Center for Law and the Environment. And it is my pleasure to welcome everybody to a um, free webinar um, with animal lawyers, Victoria Schroff and Camille Labchuk on the topic of justice for animals. Um, I'm going to uh, get us started uh, with a little bit of logistical and other information uh, before introducing our speakers. Um, the logistical information is that um, this is a webinar that is being recorded. Um, so it will be available for um, future viewing on the website of the Center for Law and the Environment. Um, we are going to have a couple of presentations followed by a question answer discussion period. Uh, and I would just like to say right out at the start in terms of logistics um, that um, when it comes to question and answer time, we're going to use the Q and A function on Zoom, which uh, you should find uh, at the bottom of your screen, wherever your Zoom controls are. We're not going to use the chat. It's just too much for us to monitor uh, everything that's going on uh, all at once. So um, uh, audience attendees, uh, please don't use the chat for commenting or, or posing questions. Um, instead, uh, when the two talks are over, we'll invite you to use the Q&A uh, function to pose questions. Uh, and then Victoria and Camille will be able to answer those. Um, I think that's the main, uh, the main logistical thing. Um, I also want to start out by um, acknowledging that uh, we, at least I, uh, and some of the other organizers and participants are on the territories of the Coast Salish peoples, the Musqueam, uh, Squamish and Tsleil-Waututh. Um, the, these are territories that have never been ceded uh, and are the ancestral and uh, um, uh, traditional territories of those First Nations. Uh, a fact that I think is relevant for today's session because the Coast Salish peoples, uh, along with uh, other indigenous peoples around the globe, uh, have uh, a relationship with non-human animals and other beings that is quite different from the way we imagine our relationship to animals in settler colonial society in Western legal systems. Uh, without essentializing or homogenizing the, the great variety of indigenous um, cultures and legal systems around the world, um, many indigenous nations consider animals to be re relatives, to be persons, to be people uh, with whom humans have morally significant relationships and to whom they owe duties and uh, responsibilities and also that those uh, non-human relatives have rights and responsibilities of their own. So I think that's something worth thinking about uh, in connection with today's session. What is the no-fly zone? It's a bit of a funny title, isn't it? Well, the no-fly zone is a virtual speaker series that we created at the Center for Law and the Environment primarily so that we could join together with um, people doing um, cutting edge, fascinating work at the intersection between law and the environment without generating massive amounts of travel related greenhouse gas emissions um, that would be associated with, you know, bringing uh, guest speakers into Vancouver and traveling to Vancouver to see 
uh, lectures or events. Uh, that was the primary reason we created this uh, no fly zone speaker series. But of course, also um, the secondary reason is that now that we are in a global pandemic, um, uh, it's almost a necessity because we can't be traveling uh, to get together and share views and developments um, with lawyers and activists and thinkers uh, around the world, uh, except on a virtual platform. Um, I'm just going to quickly give you a sense of what um, else we have uh, in this um, no fly zone series. Oh, it just stopped. Hang on a sec. I apologize for the very first technical glitch of the morning. Um, and uh, if you bear with me, I will get us right back into it uh, momentarily. And here it comes. Sorry about that. So for example, earlier this fall on October 1st, we uh, were joined by American lawyer, Stephen Donziger, who spoke about the Chevron Toxico saga. Later this fall, we're going to be joined by Anishinaabe lawyer and author, Lindsay Burroughs, who's going to talk on the subject of laws are for the lawless. Um, you can find information about these, whether you want to watch the archived recordings or you want to join live on our website, uh, allard.ubc.ca forward slash CLE. Um, we also have another uh, series of webinars coming up that we are co-hosting with West Coast Environmental Law and the two other law faculties in the province on climate accountability litigation by governments against fossil fuel companies. Uh, and that starts on November 6th and uh, you can find more information about it at the website you see on the screen bit.ly forward slash climate options. So if I can just um, take a moment now to introduce our speakers for today. Um, the, they are Victoria Shroff and Camille Labchuk. Victoria is a renowned environmental, uh, sorry, animal lawyer, uh, and she is going to speak on the topic of animal justice in practice. How can companion and wild animals access justice. Victoria is credited as one of the first and longest serving animal law lawyers in Canada. She's been practicing animal law for 20 years in downtown Vancouver at Schroff and Associates. And she's been an adjunct professor of animal law at the Allard School of Law for the past few years. Um, she created and taught a new course in animal law for Capilano University in 2019. She has represented animals at all levels of court in Canada. She's been recognized for her work in animal law, was a finalist for Canadian Lawyers Top 25 Most Influential Lawyers in Canada in 2018, 2019, and 2020, frequently is interviewed in the media about animal law matters. Uh, she's lectured on animal law in Canada, the USA, Europe, and Asia, and regularly contributes animal law articles for legal and pet publications. She was awarded the prestigious SEEDS Award from the International Society for Animal Rights for her groundbreaking work in animal law. And she founded and teaches an animal law program for kids called Paws of Empathy, which she teaches with a dog. Camille Labchuk is going to speak on the topic of animals in parliament and courtrooms representing their interests. Camille is an animal rights lawyer and, and executive director of Animal Justice, Canada's only animal law advocacy organization. Under her leadership, Animal Justice fights legal cases in courtrooms across the country, works to pass groundbreaking new laws, and ensures industries are held accountable for illegal animal cruelty. She has litigated to advance animals' legal interests at all levels of court, including before the Supreme Court of Canada. She regularly testifies before legislative committees, and she was instrumental in passing a precedent-setting national ban on whale and dolphin captivity in Canada in 2019. She's filed false advertising complaints against companies making misleading, humane claims. 
She's documented Canada's commercial seal slaughter. She's exposed hidden suffering behind the closed doors of farms and zoos through undercover investigations. She also regularly defends and protects the rights of animal advocates. She was previously a founding board member of Mercy for Animals Canada, press secretary to the leader of a federal Canadian political party, and has been a two-time candidate for parliament. She's a frequent lecturer on animal law. She's the, co uh, the co-host of the Paw and Order podcast, a regular contributor to national media publications. She's authorized a chapter about false advertising law and animal protection on, in Canadian Perspectives on Animals and the Law, and a chapter on legal protections for ethical vegans in a forthcoming edited collection. And her current research focuses on the creeping privatization of animal law and enforcement and federalism and animal law. So I'm going to turn over the podium, the virtual podium to Victoria now, um, who is going to speak on um, sorry, animal justice in practice. And I am going to um, show her slides when she tells me to start. So uh, thank you so much, uh, Victoria, and the podium is yours. Thank you. We, we can commence, thanks. Um, thank you very much for that wonderful introduction. And I'm very happy to be here. And I too uh, would like to do a land acknowledgement because I am sitting on the um, Salish, Squamish, tsleil and Musqueam Nations land as we speak from my home. And next slide, please. <clears throat> and next slide, please. Just a little bit of an introduction about myself and, and, um, and how I got to where I am and the, my personal pathway. Um, so I, um, the introduction is already stated about how I've been in practice for over 20 years in Vancouver. And um, I have been a teacher at the Allard School of Law uh, the last three times we had animal law at the university. And I also um, do a lot of mentoring, writing, interviewing, guest speaking, and volunteering. Um, for me, uh, my connection to animals started from birth. I was born in Africa near the Serengeti. And so animals are like kin to me. And this started off like I say, since I was very young, and we've had lawyers and animals in the family um, from all, going all the way back to my um, great grandfather, who was um, in the legal profession. Um, and then I went at UBC Law School. I um, then articled and summered at a, at a big firm in Vancouver called RBS Lawyers. And then I joined um, my father's firm, Schroff and Associates. Um, I founded um, the BC Animal Law Study Group. We have about 14 lawyers working on um, different matters relating to animals. And um, most recently I was involved in spearheading the LSLAP Pro Bono Animal Law Clinic at UBC. And I've been guest speaking all over the world. Next slide, please. So today's presentation is going to be kind of speedy. I'm going to talk about pathways for animals accessing justice. I'm happy to answer your questions at the end. Send article links via email. Next slide, please. So what's important, I think um, Professor Wood um, alluded to this, is that um, you know it's important that we're also talking today and delineating that we're talking about Western perspectives because um, I think it's super important that we learn and incorporate indigenous perspectives wherever we can as we move forward in animal law. But the first pathway that I'm talking about today is going to be having lawyers and law students interested in animal law in the first place. Next slide, please. So, so the teaching of animal law, that's a huge pathway. Uh, the first animal law course um, at UBC was taught in 2004 by a visiting professor, uh, Vaughn Black. And as I said, I've been teaching it for the past few years and also now teaching paralegals at the Capilano University. Next slide, please. Um, we're going to show a video about why I think it's important to teach animals about 
animal law and empathy. I teach this uh, course with a dog. I don't know if I have, do we have sound? Sorry, was it playing without sound? Okay, it must be because I don't have the sound settings uh, to play system sounds. Um, let me just see. Uh, I think the best way to make that work is for me to open it in the other, um, screen and share that screen. So hang on just a sec, folks. Okay, I'm going to do this. It's just a short video to show basically what this program is. Just a moment while we get through the ad that we have to of Empathy is a program that I developed to teach compassion to kids using a dog in a classroom. So I based a lot of my ideas on the Dalai Lama actually, um, starting very big there, but um, the Dalai Lama was talking about a program called Roots of Empathy, which uh, uses a baby to come into a classroom and explain empathy and teaches compassion, caring, social ethics, social literacy. And I figured a few years ago, I've got to make this work in the classroom setting. I've been an active volunteer in schools for almost 10 years. And I thought this is, this is a great thing to do, to try and teach kids how to become socialized and better citizens. I became an animal lawyer. I think the video is kind of glitching. So we'll probably, we'll just move on to, to the next slide. I apologize about that. No worries at all. No worries at all. I was just showing that to basically show how important it is to actually start when children are very young to bring across animal principles to them so that things are not foreign when they look at a crisis in a humane setting. They're going to be able to understand it. They're going to know it from a young age that this is not right. Um, another pathway for animals to access justice is um, like we've just started this pro bono student animal law clinic at the Law Students Legal Advice Program at UBC. And I'm told it's a Canadian first. So we um, were really, really excited about this because it just launched this month. So the ALPC is um, a poverty law clinic run by six um, clinicians that are all law students at the Peter Allard School of Law. And so what we're going to do there is we're basically taking pro bono cases and trying to help animals and their humans together access justice. Next slide. So the third pathway for animals accessing justice is animal lawyers in practice. So we have um, in BC, a little bit of BC animal law history, the woman pictured in those old newspaper articles from 1997 and 98 is um, an, an Allard grad, Kristen Tilquist, and she's credited as Western Canada's first exclusive animal law lawyer, having launched her practice in 1997. So when she left, um, Vancouver to go live in the States, I acquired her practice in 2000. And so um, I've been practicing for, for those years. And there are other lawyers in Canada also, not very many, but Leslie Biscold uh, was pioneering animal law in Ontario in the 90s as well. Next slide, please. So um, the practice pathway, I'm just gonna continue a little bit on this theme. I should actually back up here and just say what animal law is. It's any case where an animal and the law intersect. I could get into like long and convoluted um, explanations, but there's no need. I think it's just almost any type of case where the intersection happens. So it can be in dangerous dogs, horse cases, veterinary malpractice, cruelty, strata, 
civil pet custody, who's fighting for the dog on dissolution of marriage or two roommates, um, breeder laws, def I've actually had horse, a horse defamation case, uh, pet insurance, zoo and aquatic animals, um, all kinds of different wildlife issues. And in many of these practice areas, animals are used by humans in one way or another. So the other thing that I wanted to point out with um, looking at the body of case law that we have is it's actually fairly dismal. We don't have that many um, animal law cases out there to draw upon just because um, many of the cases settle or they don't even um, end up getting filed. A lot of things settle behind the scenes. Next slide, please. So yes, and also really important to note, of course, that animals are property under the law. That has not yet changed. I think we're moving away from this era. Um, and there's no doubt when you look at all the different stats and the polls, companion animals are definitely thought of as family at home and property in the court. Next slide, please. So like people, not all animals are treated equally. You see the picture of the, the companion animals, the cat and the dog at the table, and, and, and then you see the commercial animals. Uh, they're feeling really jealous because they're like, hey, you know, if, if we're mistreated, not much happens to us. And the companion animals, they have more rights. They have more ability to access justice because usually a cow, if they're lucky, just, you know, like if at that they have a number, and that's it. There's no name attached to the cow. There's no identity, unlike a companion animal with a first and a last name or a service dog or something like that. Next slide, please. Um, yes, so there was a case in 2014 from the Supreme Court of Canada and one of the justices wrote, ensuring access to justice is the greatest challenge to the rule of law in Canada today. So my question, when I turned that around and I, and I put this into an article I was writing, I said, is the concept of access to justice only to include humans or should non-human animals also be given access? And of course, my answer is a resounding yes. Um, I think access to justice to be meaningful has to include animals and rights are not finite. They are expandable. History has shown us that. Next slide, please. Um, Probably the most groundbreaking uh, case that we've ever had in Canada is um, um, Reese versus Edmonton, and it's about Lucy the Elephant case. And the dissent in that case is so thoughtful and so kind and empathic toward animals. When the Chief Justice of Alberta wrote in her dissent, the past 250 years have seen a significant evolution in the law relating to animals, though admittedly not as far as many might consider warranted. We have moved from a highly exploitive era in which humans had the right to do with animals as they saw fit to the present where some protection is accorded under laws based on an animal welfare model. In animal law, and I'm sure Camille is going to agree with me on this, dissents are hugely important. And eventually, we hope to say to ourselves that dissents can become the ratio in cases the, the, what, the, what the main part of the court would think for, for non-lawyers. And, you know, I ended up citing this dissent when I was in the Court of Appeal last year. So dissents do get used very well. Um, next slide. So I'm going to just take a quick snapshot of dangerous dogs so you can see some of this in action. In 2019, we, um, uh, my team and I did a case called Santix about punty, Punky Santix, who was Canada's every dog. And this case went up to the Court of Appeal. Um, and basically, in that case, the outcome was that the Court of Appeal clarified the law. And they said conditional orders of provincial judges were no longer permitted in dangerous dog cases. And then Santix appealed for leave to the Supreme Court of Canada. And um, so what happens here is I, I call this access to justice by negotiation because so the provincial court may no longer have jurisdiction to make conditional orders on these applications, but remedies between owners, guardians uh, of dangerous dogs um, can negotiate with the state and the animal control officers. And these agreements have been happening for years and years and years. Um, and I think that those are very much still possible and they're, they're ongoing. Next slide, please. 
so I, I really think of this case, uh, the Santix case makes, um, of course, it is in fact about a dangerous, so-called dangerous dog called Punky, but it is hugely important to me um, how it segues into uh, the whole access to justice piece. Because in this case, we had um, a woman who had just so many different hardships, but the first was that she was a self-rep. And that made it really, really hard for her to proceed through the channels of court. And she, I asked her, what was the most difficult thing about your case? And aside, of course, from eventually losing her pet, which was tragic, it was that um, her um, being self-represented was just enormously difficult. Um, and I, I will say this too, that animal law cases rarely make it past the trial level in Canada. And so for this case to be, um, to actually go as far as um, being allowed to file for leave at the Supreme Court of Canada was in fact a victory in itself. Next slide, please. So we have another video here. I just want to show, it's uh, about a minute long, uh, just to give you a little impression of Punky's case, please. And I'll do my best to make it work. So- <laughs> No worries. Uh, no worries. I hope that this works. Let's see what happens. A monkey the dog will live another day, at least 30 days to be exact. This morning, a BC Court of Appeal judge stayed at Punky's execution, giving his owner's lawyer time to appeal to the Supreme Court of Canada. The four year old Australian catalog was meant to be put down today. Having spent the last two years of his life locked up after biting a woman in an off-leash park in 2017. Earlier this summer, the BC Court of Appeal ruled Punky was dangerous, agreeing with earlier rulings of lower courts. But today, a reprieve saw Punky's owner burst into tears in the courtroom. A big day for Punky and also for animal rights law across Canada, according to the owner's lawyer. This is a victory for people who care about animals and they want to see the law catch up to where we should be treating animals as sentient beings. They are family members at home, but in court, they're property. So before the state takes away somebody's property and kills it, they better be absolutely sure this is the only option. That, you know, there was no scope for rehabilitation. Trump now plans to prepare a formal leave to appeal. It'll then be considered by the Supreme Court of Canada in Ottawa before it can be moved ahead. So that was just to give you guys a, a little snapshot on how these cases can galvanize people. We had people from not only across Canada, but people from Europe and Asia and South America saying, can you send the dog to us? We'll take him. We just don't want to see this dog killed. He really provoked this enormous outcry of the inhumanity of the way we have to say, he bit somebody, so now he has to die. Um, okay, so um, we won't have too much time for this right now, but there are cases right now that are considering whether or not an elephant is a person. And um, that's in the States right now. There, there's a big case going on for Happy the Elephant through the Non-Human Rights Project. And um, for me, it makes sense because animals are not things and elephants are cognitively super complex beings. And hey, corporations can be persons, so why not elephants? Next slide, please. I think um, it's time for a paradigm shift from the welfare-based rights that we have now to an actual rights-based model where we're looking at animals as, as rights holders. Um, and so it can't, I, I believe it can happen. Um, animals are a disenfranchised group, not unlike women, uh, who had their rights uh, very slowly, slowly come into law. And it wasn't until 1960 that all women were legal persons in Canada. And all disenfranchised groups have suffered at one time or another. And um, I think this is something that can happen for animals. Next slide, please. So um, we're going to conclude here. But, you know, what, it, what I'd like to say is that my daily round as an animal lawyer is to try to help animals and their humans obtain justice in a system that is stacked against them. So we need to widen 
our pathways to justice for animals. And there's much work to be done. Thank you. Thank you so much, Victoria. Um, we're going to turn the podium over immediately to Camille, who is going to speak about animals in parliaments and courtrooms representing their interests. And you should be able to share your own screen. So uh, go right ahead, Camille, and welcome. Thank you, Stefan. Thank you to the Center for Law and the Environment and to this lecture series and uh, to all of you for tuning in today and as well to Victoria. It's great to share the stage with you. I'm going to see if I can figure out the share screen thing. Good. Okay. All right. So I'm going to talk to you today a little bit about some of animal justice's work, making sure that animals have a voice in Canadian courts and legislatures. Now, unlike the work that Victoria does, we come at it from a bit of a different perspective because we don't take on clients ourselves. We are the clients. So we seek out our own cases and issues that we believe advance animal law. A bit of background on me, I grew up in PEI on the east coast of Canada, and some of my earliest memories of caring about animals are seeing images of the commercial seal slaughter on television and just being in disbelief that it was legal to do that kind of thing to an animal, to specifically club in the heads of baby seals. I um, ended up, after I did an undergraduate degree in psychology, I worked for Elizabeth May, former leader, former now leader of the Green Party for a number of years. I was her press secretary. And I was starting to think around this time about how I could get more involved in the issues I cared about and what my next career move might be. And I knew I wanted to do something around animals, but it was seeing how Elizabeth May, as an environmental lawyer in her past career, how she used the law to be more effective in the work that we were doing in Parliament. Uh, really inspired me to think more seriously about that as a path. And eventually my interest in SEALs came full circle. I was invited to go back to uh, PEI and help with campaigns with the Humane Society International Organization, which um, attended at the ICE every year and photographed and videotaped the commercial SEAL kill, which uh, they then used those images to convince the European Union and a variety of other countries to shut down the international trade in SEAL products and take a huge bite out of the Canadian uh, commercial seal kill. So I saw the power of that type of animal advocacy and I thought I will combine this law thing with this animal thing and here we are. So I went to law school at University of Toronto. I got involved uh, just, just sort of before I'd started, a colleague had, had founded a group called Lawyers for Animal Welfare, which was really no more than a uh, website and a very, very small bank account for uh, its early years. We eventually morphed into animal justice, and uh, that's the group that I now lead today. I practiced criminal law for a couple years along the way, but I always had my foot solidly in the animal rights law sphere. So let's just quickly, before we get into some statistics, review the legal status of animals in Canada. So unfortunately, despite the massive numbers that we use, and, and here are some of those statistics, I think the most staggering of these is the number of animals we kill for food. There's 834 million land animals who were killed last year alone in Canada. That doesn't include any aquatic animals whatsoever. We killed over a million tons of them, and they're not counted as individuals. Their lives are measured in tons. Um, but, you know, despite or perhaps because of the staggering numbers of animals that we use as a society, use and abuse, uh, none of these animals have any legally enforceable rights. So they're treated as property and they don't have rights in the same way that humans do that um, can be enforced in court. They do have some protections. So many of these animals must be given appropriate food or water or veterinary care. But if there's a violation of that, there's, there's no way for them to enforce those rights as we could in our circumstances. Uh, you know, and I, I think the issue of justice for animals is only increasing. Um, despite many people reporting that they're eating less meat, uh, the number of animals that we're killing for food each year keeps going up. This is largely due to an increase in the number of chickens who are being slaughtered. People are moving away to some extent from red meat like beef and pork. Uh, but when they move toward chickens or fishes, that actually results in significantly more suffering because they're smaller and more individual lives have to be taken. So, um, you know, as I mentioned, we, we don't really have regulate, animals don't have rights in Canada and neither are there really any regulations for most of the industries that use them. Uh, for the most part, barring some specific things in some provinces and some minimal federal regulation, uh, there are, 
typically not that many laws that apply to the use of animals. Even our federal criminal code, which doesn't regulate animal use, but it does provide sort of a baseline of what conduct is acceptable to animals in the criminal conducts. It says that you can't cause unnecessary pain, suffering, or injury to an animal through actions or neglect, for instance. Um, you know, even our criminal code hasn't been significantly updated since the 1950s and until last year, and we'll get to that. Uh, but this member of parliament, Nathaniel Erskine Smith, some of you might know him. He's a liberal from Beaches East York in Toronto. He's also a lawyer. He's in his mid thirties. He was elected in 2015 for the first time and he's vegan. He cares about animal rights and uh, was raised vegetarian and thought when he got elected that one of the first things he would do was try to bring in a bill to improve criminal code protections. This was not an earth shattering bill. This was a bill that would have updated our laws in line with the direction that other countries are going in. Um, unfortunately, his bill, uh, which also included a ban on shark fin products and tightening bestiality loopholes, was overwhelmingly defeated, including by members of his own party, which mostly voted against the legislation. Uh, now, why is that? Why is it that even very minimal protections for animals have trouble getting through Parliament? The answer to this is the power of the industries that are invested in using animals for profit. Let me just tell you one anecdote about the power of these industries. And I always pick on the dairy lobby. So if some of you've heard me speak before, this won't be new information to you. But the dairy lobby, for instance, a couple of years ago at the Conservative Party convention, when they were considering policies about supply management, which would have affected their industry, the dairy lobby was there in full force. And one of them left behind their secret binder of dirty tricks on the convention floor. A journalist found it and published this piece in the National Post. Uh, the, the intro to this piece notes that the dairy farmers are basically considered the NRA of Canada. And uh, the reason for that is that they are powerful and they spend a lot of money lobbying politicians to have laws that protect their interests. They went to this convention and they had numerous receptions where MPs and even the conservative leader at that point, Andrew Scheer, were invited to participate. So they are in there. And in part of the work that we do as animal lawyers, we want to be in there too, because animals need voices in those spheres. So one thing that animal justice does is we've set up another uh, separate project called Humane Voters Canada, which uh, works to make sure that animal friendly MPs get elected in the first place so that they're in parliament and they're able to champion animal protection issues. Uh, this is a screenshot of a webpage from 2015 when uh, first crop of animal friendly MPs were elected. You'll see Nathaniel Erskine Smith in there. And I can tell you that all of these MPs from a variety of parties have been instrumental in helping advance uh, the protections of animals in the last parliament. Uh, we actually go door to door and help MPs reach out to voters and let them know, let voters know if MPs have a strong record on animals or not. So one way that this um, was beneficial was in the last parliament when we started to see some major progress towards advancing the interests of animals. So parliament considered a bill that would ban whale and dolphin captivity. Now, many of you are uh, situated pretty close to Vancouver Aquarium, which was the ground zero for much of the discussion about whale and dolphin captivity. Um, in 2015, 2016 area, a number of um, whales, beluga whales died. The aquarium never discerned why. But that coupled with bad press out of marine land for years, um, detailing allegations of animal cruelty, was enough to inspire Canadians to demand better and, and really support this ban in a major way. So um, we were involved in a number of court cases, which I don't have time to get into today against Vancouver Aquarium. And um, you know, what ultimately happened is that the support for this measure was so strong that even though there were some senators who were, you know, playing games with it and trying to stall it and try to, trying to stop it from passing to protect marine land and Vancouver Aquarium's financial interests. Support from Canadians overwhelmed the Senate email system at one point when the bill was under threat and carried that bill through to the finish line. So that bill, um, fortunately, did pass last spring. And, uh, you know, subsequent to that, we were able to identify a lot more animal champions who were endorsed in the last election and subsequently reelected. So, you know, you take that from just a few champions of animals to a number, uh, about 25 and, and more that we don't even know yet. Uh, and then you start to see what real progress looks like when you've got all these voices in there fighting for the right thing. Um, you know, another issue that we saw progress on in the last session was shark finning. So Canada passed a national ban on um, importing shark fins and exporting them, which is huge and the first uh, country in the world to do this. 
Animal Justice actually fought a court case in 2012. We tried to intervene in a case where um, the city of Toronto had banned shark fin products and uh, the courts were asked to strike it down. So that was our first foray into courts, which I'm going to pivot to now and talk about a little bit of the work we do trying to give animals a voice in court. So unfortunately, we were denied intervener status in that case. Um, intervening in cases has been a very important tool for us. Now, it's strategic for a couple of reasons. First of all, it gives you as an organization uh, the opportunity to make representations in court and point judges towards the issues that we think are important. But second of all, it's relatively low risk. Unlike bringing litigation yourself, which could bankrupt an organization if you lose successive motions, uh, interventions are much less costly in terms of cost awards, and they're much less expensive to bring. So they're a very important vehicle to getting that information about animals before the court. So we were inter denied intervener status in this case, and unfortunately the court struck down the challenge to Toronto's anti-shark fin bylaw. I don't know if it would have been different if we were there. But luckily it came full circle last spring, and again, Ottawa finally enact enacted a national import ban. Where our very first successful intervention was actually at the Supreme Court of Canada, which I, you know, I gotta say, it was pretty exciting. It was, it was just uh, five years ago this week, actually, that we filed our submissions. And we argued the case in early November. So this is a case about, unfortunately, the topic of bestiality. A man in British Columbia had been convicted of um, using the family dog as a tool to sexually abuse his two stepdaughters. Uh, the issue was that there was no penetration of the dog or by the dog. And the uh, court said that the offense of bestiality actually had to involve penetration. So that was um, the BC Court of Appeal said that. It went to the Supreme Court and we knew we had to be there to make sure animals had a voice in that proceeding because the way, I mean, the defense is obviously representing the interests of the accused. Uh, the Crown was representing, theoretically, they could have represented the interests of the animals, but they were focused almost exclusively on the impact of the law on children and children's sexual abuse, which important issue but it ignores the issue of animals. So my colleague, Professor Peter Sankoff at the University of Alberta and I, we intervened in that case and made oral arguments before the Canadian uh, Supreme Court, which was very exciting. And in the end, the court disagreed with our perspective and opened up this bestiality loophole, but um, Justice Abella did agree with us. Uh, she wrote a dissent that captured our submissions and, and said that protecting animals was very important. And even the majority, so this is a quote from the majority decision. Um, they accepted that based on our submissions, the fundamental values at stake in that debate include the protection of vulnerable animals. So very important recognition from Canada's top court about the value of animals and animal protection. Eventually, this case um, you know, came full circle for us again last spring. The government uh, proposed and finally passed amendments to the criminal code that closed that bestiality loophole. Um, I testified before the committee and we were able to increase the strength of that ban by um, making a few other minor changes to the criminal code and also ensuring that nobody convicted of bestiality could own an animal in the future, which was not originally proposed in that bill. Uh, another issue that's coming up for us, and you've already heard a lot about this from us and from me, and you will even more soon, is the issue of egg gag laws in Canada. So these are agricultural gag laws that make it an offense to go undercover in a factory farm or slaughterhouse to expose animal cruelty. Now they do this by saying that when a person cannot use false pretenses to get access to a facility, which would include an undercover investigator wired with a camera, who has the intention of exposing animal cruelty and filming it if they see it in the workplace. Now, these exposés have been extremely important to sensitizing Canadians to the abuse that happens to animals behind closed doors on farms. As we saw earlier, these are the, um, the, the group of animals that we use and abuse the most. I think conditions are among the worst and certainly the, they have the numbers. So W5, for instance, and other media outlets too, have done pretty stunning exposés based on our undercover footage that has emerged. And as you can imagine, the meat industry does not like these videos. They know that when the public learns the truth about what animals endure, the public is inspired to leave animals off their plate and actually call for laws protecting animals on farms, of which there are no uh, regulations or oversight by the government right now. So uh, Alberta has now passed an egg gag bill uh, that passed about a year ago with almost no public debate. They rammed it through in 10 days. Shortly after, Ontario followed suit. And last June, they passed Bill 156 in Ontario, which again, shuts down undercover investigations. 
and also interferes with the activities of activists who do um, advocacy outside slaughterhouses, including filming inside trucks, which is also another way that we're able to see the truth of what animals endure. So um, we believe that uh, these egg gate bills are unconstitutional and we intend to challenge them in court as soon as we can. Ontario's bill is not quite in effect yet. There are still drafting regulations that will accompany it. And it uh, should be later this year or very early next. But um, over 40 leading constitutional criminal law experts and professors have written to Ontario to say that this type of law is unconstitutional. And in fact, what we've seen in the United States where egg gag laws have their origin is that uh, over or now five states have struck egg gag laws down in court uh, for the same reasons that we're saying they're unconstitutional here, which is that they restrict um, people's charter rights to freedom of expression and possibly freedom of assembly. So I just want to share a couple of lessons I think I've learned in the years I've been doing this work which is, first of all, that law follows society. It's not the other way around. So I don't think that you can just pass a law and suddenly everybody's behavior will change in line with that law. I think rather that laws reflect existing societal values. So um, the, there's a limit to what I think we can accomplish for animals as animal rights lawyers. And that limit is that you, you can't go further than what society is ready for. Uh, so recognizing that it's important to take a strategic pro approach to these issues. The second is the value of publicity. And this goes back to the issue of social change. It's, it's not just that law follows society, but law can also influence society to move down the path uh, towards social change that we're looking for. So it's important to publicize efforts. And uh, you know, I will say most of the cases, I shouldn't say most, but a lot of the cases we've been involved with have lost or they haven't turned out the way we wanted them to on paper. But in the end, we still might get a victory. So the bestiality laws are a perfect example of that. Lost at the Supreme Court, but eventually won in parliament and along the way, we got exposure for the issues. Interventions, as I've discussed, I think hold real promise and real value because they're high impact and low risk for smaller organizations. And uh, another issue is that um, we often find ourselves in the position, because animals have no rights, of relying on human rights. So the, the egg gag issue is a great example of that. Um, animals in those situations kept behind the closed doors of factory farms enduring vicious abuse. They don't have rights, but you and I each have the right to freedom of expression, which protects not just the right of me to say something, but the right of you to hear that information as well. So use those rights whenever you can. That includes false advertising, that includes all kinds of constitutional claims. Um, litigation, not a, it's, I look at it as a tool. It's not an end on its own. And in fact, what we often see is a conversation between litigation and legislation. Um, so I, you know, we try not to think of litigation as accomplishing the goal on its own, but we think of campaign priorities and ways that litigation can be used to advance animals' interests within those priorities. And finally, legislation is a huge part of that conversation too, and there's a major interaction there. So I will leave it at that. That's my contact information, and uh, I know this was short and I sped through a lot of it, so I'm happy to answer questions when we get to that point. Thank you so much, Camille. Um, we are at that point, believe it or not. Uh, we're at the point where we can begin to take questions. Um, we have just over, well, just about 10 minutes for question and answer. Um, you'll find the Q&A uh, function in your Zoom controls, which are normally at the bottom of your screen. Um, and a few questions have already been um, been uh, typed in. Uh, people can go ahead and add in questions. You'll also see that you can upvote questions or comment on questions if you're interested. So we invite you uh, to do that. But what I would suggest is that um, we take the first few questions uh, and I can read them out for, for the recording. Uh, and just let, uh, we'll take them sort of in a chunk and then just let uh, Victoria and Camille uh, respond as they'd like to, to those questions. So let me just do that um, and I will then click uh, answer live. So Sedwin Bliss asks, how can justice be extended to wild animals in particular problematic groups such as invasive alien species? The next question from Joe Wills is uh, for Victoria. You favor moving towards a rights-based legal framework for animals. What potential pathways to this framework might be worth exploring in Canada? 
And then let's take the third one from Janelle Cooper. How do we change the designation of pest species in our province. As Victoria knows, Galliano Island animal advocates are working to change bylaws regarding inhumane trapping of raccoons, which are classified as pests. Um, what more can local residents do to move conversations towards action, not just in specific cases, but with broader legislative and provincial guideline processes? And there's more to it there, but that's where I'll stop. And I will just invite um, Camille and Victoria to respond to those three questions. And um, yeah, just go right ahead. Should I start for, I just, uh, hi Janelle. Like I, we know Janelle and we know Joe who are, you know, the, some of the question, uh, people who are asking the questions. Um, the issue with the raccoons and questions around that um, are, it's very interesting because it is a place where you can see municipal law intersecting with provincial laws. And um, in Galliano Island this summer, we had a situation where we had a forum and Elizabeth May kindly attended. She mentioned Camille, by the way, while we were at the forum. And, um, you know, we were talking about how we were going to bring coexistence to different communities because I think that's one of the way forwards to sort of answer both Janelle and Joe at the same time. I think coexistence with wild animals is imperative um, and so one of the ways to help um, uh, in terms of the the leg we were trying to get um, and we're still working on trying to get leg hole traps banned and they've been a bane for I don't know how long I can't believe that they are still legal um, and, you know, so anybody who thinks that they should be wearing a Canada goose jacket, um, understand where that, that trim on the jacket came from. It came from a leg hole trap where somebody was humane, inhumanely sitting in that trap for days on end, probably. Um, and so these traps are absolutely horrible. So one of the ways would be saying, let's get these traps banned provincially and actually federally. Um, and then, so we'd sort of put the, the stop on it at that level. And it's, you know, so again, like Camille was saying at the end about um, the intersection of litigation and legislation. And so the, it's usually a multifaceted approach that has to, has to happen. I'm gonna let Camille jump in. We don't have much time and I know she's an expert, so. <laughs> oh, sure. I mean, I'll just add, I, I think the invasive, um, you know, pest question, are both uh, sort of getting at a similar thing, which is human supremacy, frankly. We as um, a society, and I don't mean the people here today, but I mean largely our legal system uh, treats humans as always, always paramount. It doesn't matter what interest or need the animals have, human interests, no matter how trivial, are going to outweigh those in most cases when it comes to animals. So I think we need this broader societal shift to get away from that human supremacist attitude and toward a more coexistence model and a cooperative model where we've got interne interconnected communities with humans, with animals, with environment, with indigenous peoples. Um, and I think uh, that's a bigger issue than probably animal lawyers can tackle with just a case because it gets at these real human values that are pervasive in society. So I don't know that that's a very helpful answer, but that's my analysis. And I would just note that there was one other question in there, which was, what do you think is the most promising pathway toward legal rights for animals in Canada? Do either of you have quick thoughts about that? Well, I think that probably um, most people in who are practice, most of the practitioners in animal law will say that one of the ways forward is removing animals from the property category. And um, ele basically elevating their status from a thing to something or someone or a person. That's, that's one way. And how we get there, um, wait, stay tuned. Yeah, I would say there's interesting litigation being done right now. There's attempts in multiple countries to enshrine some legal rights for some animals. For instance, there's a ballot initiative in Switzerland that is going to move forward. Uh, that will ask voters in one region at least to consider whether great apes, I believe, should have legally enforceable rights. And I think that's the kind of thing where you can approach that through the legislature or through the courts. Um, I think it's an uphill battle no matter how you go about it, but uh, the strategy so far has been to focus on these charismatic uh, megafauna species who don't have immense economic value. So one of the barriers I see to 
regimes like this that are more rights based is of course that the industry lobby is going to step in and say, oh, it's the thin edge of the wedge, it's a slippery slope. If you do this, then nobody's gonna be able to have a chicken for dinner anymore in the future. And I think the way that you address that is by going for those species initially as a strategy who have marginal economic value. Um, humans exploit great apes much less than we used to. In many places, uh, they're not used for research any longer. And so I think that's why you see organizations and individual campaigns going uh, in that direction and focusing on those species. Now, I, I personally am not as hung up on the property versus personhood paradigm as, as some others are. I think that um, corporations, which are property of people that also have legal rights, um, already show us that an entity could be property but also have legal rights. So what I would be really interested in seeing in Canada is some type of court case, and maybe we'll bring this court case someday, where uh, standing is sought on behalf of animals. So just the ability to go there to court and have a court evaluate whether the legal rights that apparently already exist, such as ability to be free from pain and, and suffering, um, are enforceable by that court. Yeah, and uh, just to add, uh, of course, to uh, Camille, uh, what you were saying there, courts in India and Argentina have applied existing constitutional rights provisions to animals in some cases. So uh, it may not require new law, it may require new interpretations of existing law. Um, I think we have time to take two more questions that are in the Q&A queue. Um, and so let me just pose those two and uh, see what Camille and Victoria think. So one, is there any way, this is from Joey Savoy, is there any way to watch animal court cases online, live, or historical cases? And then from RJ, do you see any possible backfire effect from using and relying on human rights to advance animal interests such that if human rights violations don't exist in a particular case, the court won't recognize the animal rights? So those are two questions, and they, those will probably be our last two questions. Yeah, well, I, I can uh, take the one first about watching court cases. I mean, historically, it's been pretty challenging. Um, Supreme Court does live stream its cases or records them for future use at the very least. Uh, but animal cases don't often go to the Supreme Court. But I think we're entering a whole new Zoom era of court cases. So I saw on Facebook yesterday that there's an activist who I know quite well, Malcolm Klimovich, who has been charged with uh, multiple criminal offenses in multiple jurisdictions in Ontario for allegedly going onto fur farms at night and filming horrific conditions. So he's facing a trial at the end of this month, early December in Kingston. And uh, I believe all you need to do to watch the four or five day trial is email the trial coordinator and ask for the Zoom link. So I think we're approaching a whole new potential era of transparency. Um, the second question about the backlash I, you know, I think human rights, we need to look at them as a tool. Um, you know, if there's a more animal centric way of getting into court, that's also important to do. But uh, most cases right now, there's not. So I think it's important to use whatever tools we've got at our disposal. Yeah. And I'll just say, I'll just add to that by saying that, you know, some people say, why are you standing up for animals and their needs when so many humans are suffering? And the answer to that is that rights are expandable. It is not a finite pot. We can get there together. So it's not a zero sum game. You can have rights for humans and rights for animals and pursuing both together enlarges them for all, right? Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. And you look at the history of human rights law and that's certainly borne out. There's always skepticism about adding new rights to our repertory of rights. And those concerns are just never borne out. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, so the backlash is when people laugh at you, they ridicule you then they stop and they start to criticize you and then they believe you, you know? Well, I think that's where we should draw it to a close. Uh, that's a really good thought to end on. Um, please join me everybody in thanking Victoria and Camille for a really informative, inspiring, challenging uh, presentations. Thank you to the uh, attendees for the very thoughtful questions. We have a lot to think about and even more we have to uh, a lot to get going uh, on and doing. So please thank, uh, join me in thanking both our panelists. Thank you Camille and Thank Wood. you for having us yeah. and for everyone who tuned in.
Yes, yeah. thank you, everybody. So I will uh, draw us to a close. So please join us next time for the No Fly Zone, uh, which will be now I forget the date. Is it November 17th or November 19th with uh, Anishinaabe lawyer Lindsay Burroughs, who's going to talk about laws are for the lawless. And uh, with that, I will say good day to everybody. <laughs>